Sophia is the vice president of the Washington, D.C. chapter of the Virtual Reality Augmented Reality Association and co-hosts their podcast called Everything VR and AR. Sophia met me at our offices in Washington, D.C., where I tested out the Oculus VR headset. Oh, wow. What's cool about this headset is that it has what's called inside-out tracking, and it's setting its own, you're setting your own boundaries around the headset. So if you step out of bounds, you'll see a kind of like a, a screen come up around you, kind of warning you that you're stepping out of bounds and that you might be hitting something. So if I walk this way, up oh, there it is right there. There's the yep. boundary. Yep. And the boundary's here and here. I like the uh, ocean spray coming up off the rocks too. It's, it's some really nice features. Yeah, so you're in, um, you're in their first mode pretty much of, of what they've developed, but this application is actually coming out with a real realistic lifelike version of golf courses. And I think these are the types of things that are going to make, you know, traditional gaming and VR gaming um, more appetizing and interesting to those that aren't traditional gamers. These immersive technologies have the potential to change every industry, not just gaming. Sophia has helped companies and government agencies to figure out how to use VR to accomplish their goals. I was just reading, just bought like 60,000 of them and they're gonna use it for training. I mean, talk to us about industries that are uh, quickly adapting to this and where do you see it going? Yeah, so that, that's Accenture that just bought the 60,000 headsets. Walmart, I believe, bought Oculus Go, the first iteration, one of the first iterations of, of the Oculus um, a few years back again. Um, and, and that was even in the most simplistic way of training. And that was 360 degree video. People just put on the headset and they watch and they see um, different scenarios happening happening around them, and you know what they should be doing and expected to be doing in those different scenarios. Um, there's, I, I would say, training is probably one of the best use cases for this technology. Education, training, you can kind of lump them together. We are, you know, we are three D spatialized people. I mean, we learn from what we do in an environment. And I always said that VR was the next best thing to being there, to doing things in real life. And so when you're making people do things and experience things, they understand the good things that can come out of actions. They, they can understand the consequences that are coming out of actions, you know, and, and doing that, you know, companies are experiencing some and realizing some great ROI in, in their investments. And especially in the world that we live in now of all this remote collaboration, um, you know, you, you no longer have to transport people to facilities to be able to learn whatever it is they, that they want to learn. You just deliver them a headset at the point of need even. You know, you don't have to put them through a month long a uh, training course when you're, you're literally delivering them training at the times where they're going to then need it to apply it. Um, even in, in maybe dangerous scenarios, let's say like oil rigs, a lot of times people don't, e the companies don't even allow people to train in those rigs because it's so dangerous. And so they watch videos of what could happen if they, um, they messed up in, in, in the protocol. But in virtual reality, I'm able to fail safely. I'm able to make a mistake, see the consequences of my action, and then understand what, what that is and, and never do it again, hopefully. Police departments across the country are beginning to incorporate virtual reality in their training programs. This technology from RAP Reality simulates dangerous scenarios that officers might encounter on the job. This type of training allows officers to practice de-escalation, conflict resolution, and thinking critically when force is needed. The pandemic has accelerated a lot of industries, and I suspect it's, it's changed uh, 
the trajectory of this industry as well. How has it influenced it? Oh yeah, I mean, I think it's our industry's projected. I saw something at like like eighty billion dollars or something in the next five years. Um, it's interesting because I think it hindered it in some way, but it allowed it to excel and accelerate in a lot of ways. Where like a lot of the companies in our industry are small businesses, right? Because it's a new technology, um, it's a niche industry. So a lot of them are smalls doing a lot of innovative things, but the pandemic really haltered their work. You know, so a lot of them did go out of business or you know had to pivot or those types of things. However, I think in the grand scheme of things, it has really accelerated the trajectory of our industry. You know, people are, I think it was already on that pathway, but people are now looking for solutions. You know, they always say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So, but, but now things were broke. So they're looking for different solutions. And now, and people are getting Zoom fatigue. There's a lot of things on video conferencing that you, you just can't do as well as you could have in real life, right? You're on Zoom for, um, for a very focused conversation, right? And usually one person is talking at a time. You know, you can't have all these multiple conversations going on at once. And, um, and then you end the meeting and, and then you go home. Whereas nowadays, like I run a, um, an annual charity golf meetup or tournament in virtual reality where people come in and there's conversations happening on every corner of the room. And I can go up and, and walk into a conversation and start talking to those, those people, meet new people, just like as I would in real life. I mean, there, there's 3D spatial audio that goes on within these platforms as well. So it really replicates this real life experience just in, in an immersive environment. So I think people, companies, enterprises, organizations, are figuring out other ways to kind of make the world go around to, to, to be successful in their, in their work and in their businesses um, by, by implementing these various technologies. And I think the pandemic has kind of forced companies to be experimental. Um, and so in doing that, now we've gotten like the proof of concept prototype phase out of the way. And now I think we're at the point where we're able to start scaling some of the investments that were made earlier on in immersive technologies. No one would argue that you're in a really crummy profession. It's exciting, <laughs> it's interesting. How'd you get into it? I just wound up in this industry. I mean, I do marketing and sales for a living. That's what I was trained in professionally. And I came into this company thinking that they did IT and cybersecurity, and lo and behold, they did a lot a lot more cool things than, I, than what I thought. Um, a lot of experien experiential and interactive type of technologies. I, being in the position that I was in, was doing a lot of market research, and I was seeing who were the key players in the technology, what the capabilities were with, with the tech, and kind of keeping up with all of that, and that's what kind of made me fall in love with the, the industry and the fact that I could kind of take work, take the technology wherever I wanted to within a variety of industries. I mean, if you think about it as a medium of communication, like video is, like the internet and radio and others, I mean, it applies to entertainment, it applies to DOD, healthcare, manufacturing, I mean, any, education. Wherever you go with your career, I mean, the technology is going to be right there with you eventually. Do you feel like you're kind of a loner out there? Because I suspect there aren't a lot of women out there in your role. Nope, there are not, um, which um, provides a lot of op opportunity for me at the same time. But uh, I think it's, Im it's important for women, or anybody really, but women to realize that there's opportunities for anybody in this industry, <laughs> even if you don't have um, a technological background. And I actually co-founded a, a group, a community called XR Women, and we have about 400 members of our uh, of our community now. And every week we host um, we host events led by thought leaders in our industry on immersive platforms, 3D platforms, where um, 30 to 40 women join us every week, and we provide them with mentorship, 
job opportunities, con just connections in general, and just really hope for the fact that they have a place in this industry. Well, we need subject matter expertise in a, vi a variety of different professions. We need them to inform the development of the technology and where we apply the technology and how we apply it. So in that sense, I think there's, there's opportunity from people with a variety of backgrounds and, and women are definitely a valuable asset to that. The metaverse refers to a virtual universe where someone could potentially live their entire life online. Facebook is betting that the metaverse will be the next generation of the internet. The social media giant says it plans to hire 10,000 people to work on its virtual reality platform. And it's even changed its company name to Meta. So you hear a lot of talk about the metaverse, and there's a lot of definitions around that. But um, I would say the general consensus around the metaverse is that it is going to be a place or a series of connected places that are interoperable, um, that are persistent, like, like my one avatar in one instance is persistent when I go somewhere else. I can bring along the, um, the clothing and apparel and things that I have, these NFTs. I mean, that's when we, now we're talking about other types of technologies that are coming in. Um, and I can own that and own myself and those things in this, this open metaverse. Facebook is striving to become the owner or the king of the metaverse. They rebranded to Meta. So you'll start hearing more about, about Meta there. So it's interesting because they see the, the importance as well of, uh, of these immersive technologies and the growth of these, these virtual ecosystems and virtual environments. And so, you know, they have something called Facebook Horizons, which is their version of the social um, VR social platform. It's interesting, though. We've got this is reality, and you're talking about augmented reality, virtual reality, this other kind of environment that's going to be very real, kind of similar to what we're doing right now. Uh, you know, and it sounds so science fiction. Of course, everybody always has kind of a, a gloom and doom look at these things. You know, like this. This could go tragically wrong. What are the ethics involved and, and all of that sort of thing? We're in the day and age where technology is a part of our daily lives, different types of technology. There's a lot, a lot of new types of data that can be collected through these mediums. And you know, now you have a, a literally a virtualized presence um, through these mediums as well. I mean, through the internet, we hear of scams that happen where people are taking your identity and your, you know, your credit card, getting you to input data and all this stuff. And, and they put on a front that they're a website that, that you're familiar with. Um, and virtual reality, I don't know if you've heard of deep fakes, but <laughs> yeah, and, and in virtual reality, I mean, that trust issue and that barrier is just like, you know, the, there's a much more of that gray line of, 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 of trust, right? Because I can literally pretend to be somebody that you know. My voice box could, could replicate that, all of those things. And um, I could coax you to do something, give me some type of information, whatever it might be, um, because I am now a human being. I'm no longer a computer or typing something on a computer saying I'm somebody, you know, I'm, I'm more believable. And when you believe something that much, then you're more likely to, to, to be more inclined to, to follow that lead, right? At the end of the day, I think it's in everybody's best interest to just stay educated and, and figure out what's right for you and, and just know that, um, Things are watching us, you know, if it's not VR, it's, it's our phones. I mean, they're listening to us, you know, so <laughs> it, it'll be an interesting world that we live in. But I think in, in a lot of cases, it's going to be, it's going to be good. It's going to be interesting. It'll, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have information delivered to us, the right information, the information that we're looking for delivered to us at the point in times that, that we need it most, so. Okay, so we took a dark turn there for a while. So let me steer us back in the <laughs> other direction. Um, as someone who is immersed in this uh, industry 
and someone who does a podcast talking to people out there working on all the different exciting new developments. What excites you most about the future? Right now, um, the, the, the World Wide Web Consortium is working on a WebXR initiative where you can basically plug in a URL into your web browser and you can access immersive content through your browser. And that's gonna be huge uh, because now we're talking about um, open source and we're not talking about like closed off uh, applications anymore where you have to download something in order to access something, some, some information. Being able to connect with people that I wouldn't have been able to otherwise. Um, being able to dream up any possibility that you want to in these in this metaverse of spaces. I mean, I could I've had meetings and events on 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 the moon before. I saw the land the the actual landing of of, of, Mar, um, of Mars um, on planet Mars itself. So I, I went into an immersive space to watch that. So I think the possibilities are endless. You know, you, you, you see enterprises that are entering into this space kind of recreating reality because it makes sense. It's what makes sense to us. It's what we can relate it to. Okay, we can't go into work, so I'm gonna recreate the workplace. But I, what I think we're gonna see is, is, you know, okay, now what can we do with this technology that we actually can't do in real life? Now, how do we reimagine what the workplace might look like in these virtual spaces, for example. And so I think that's gonna be super exciting to see when, when people start getting really creative and out of the box with the applications of the technology. Well, thank you for introducing us to the future. The future is now and it's, uh, and it's also rapidly approaching. It's, it's a fascinating subject, thanks so much. That's right, thank you.